Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ryan Smith, and today we are going to discuss a brief history of time complexity. Uh, well, what is time complexity? It's an important concept in computer science, and essentially what it is is the amount of time it takes for any algorithm to finish up. So, of course, this can be pretty important when um, writing functions, and for that matter, the audience should be uh, pretty comfortable uh, with writing um, basic functions and for loops in JavaScript. So keep that in mind, and feel free to pause at any time if you need to study some of the functions that we'll be writing. All right, well, time complexity, you can think of it in terms of the size and number of inputs n. Constant time is an algorithm that always takes roughly the same amount of time, no matter how big the inputs are. Linear time, the time varies directly with the size of the input, kind of like a constant slope in algebra. And then quadratic time, uh, the time varies by n squared. So not too bad when there's a small size of inputs, but once those increase, the amount of time it takes to finish the algorithm will uh, increase rapidly. Uh, so with that said, a little pre-quiz. So how would you rank time complexities in terms of preference and optimization? That is, which one would you want to uh, ideally have and which one might be the least ideal? So I'll give you a couple seconds here to rank them however you see fit. All right, as I'm sure you imagined, constant time is awesome. It's the best, because no matter how big your inputs are, well, the algorithm takes roughly the same amount of time. Linear time, hey, pretty good. Sometimes, particularly when you're processing data, you know, your algorithm will definitely vary uh, depending on the size of the input, but it won't explode in time. And, of course, quadratic time is uh, the least ideal. Uh, because, like I said, the more inputs you have in place, just the longer it takes for the computer to process it. And that can really become uh, time-consuming once you have a large data set. And so, uh, why do we care? Well, just to reiterate, we want our algorithms to be as fast as possible, ideally. Time is precious, and sometimes they say time is money. And it gives you the ability to optimize, optimize a little bit more, and then... You guessed it, optimize again. Okay, so this might all be a bit abstract at the moment, so let's come up with some examples here. So constant time, and you'll notice the big O with the parentheses one, that's what we call big O notation. And when you see a one in the parentheses, that simply means constant time. So you'll see that um, as you continue uh, studying computer science. Uh, and constant time, no matter how much data we're working with, the algorithm always takes roughly the same amount of time. All right, so we can think of having an input, right? And this is basically how hash functions and tables work, uh, objects in uh, JavaScript. So an input, you throw it in there, and then some haps, hash function processes it and basically turns it into a, 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 a number, perhaps, basically which represents a spot in memory. And then, with that spot in memory known, the computer can directly place that piece of data. So it's basically um, a one-step process once you've hashed the input, and that is in constant time. And again, if you added another input, it would go through the hash function, and it would uh, be hashed, and then you could place it, boom, directly into uh, the hash table. And no matter how uh, large or small the hash table is, you can think of this um, being taking about the same amount of time, no matter if there's 10 uh, entries in the hash table or 10,000. So that's constant time. Linear time, uh, and there's that big O notation with uh, the N there. That's what linear time looks like in big O. And it's the amount of time an algorithm takes is directly proportional to the size of an input. So you think of like a line graph with a constant slope. The more inputs you have, uh, it directly correlates with how long it takes. So take a look at this function. And we're going to find the even numbers in an array. 
that we throw into there as a parameter. So we'll start by um, creating a variable called evens, where we're going to store all of the even numbers we find. And then we're going to loop through the array uh, just one time. And if the array, uh, if the item at that index, uh, rather, is divisible by 2, that is, the remainder, when you divide it by 2, uh, is equal to 0, then we will push that um, item into the evens array. And then finally, we'll just return that array at the end. So this will be all of our even numbers in an array that we want to throw in originally. So why is this linear time? Uh, well, we basically loop through the array. So if the array was 10 units of time, uh, or excuse me, if it had a length of 10 items, it would take 10 units of time. And an array, if an array had a length of 100,000, it would take 100,000 units of time. So directly proportional there. All right, so another little challenge here. Of what time complexity is this algorithm? So we, throw, we do our uh, even numbers function that we saw before. So it's going to loop through that array. And then here's another loop where we take that even numbers array and then we multiply all of them by 2, basically. So I'll give you a second to kind of figure out the time complexity there. Well, it may come as kind of a surprise, but this is still, in fact, linear. Uh, and you may be thinking, hey, we looped through it twice. What's going on here? Uh, we, did, we just didn't iterate it through it one time. We had to do it a couple times. Well, even though we did have to iterate uh, through a couple of times to uh, complete this entire algorithm, uh, that is finding the even numbers and multiplying them by 2, um, we we did it once, and then we looped through it again, and those loops were independent of each other. So essentially, this would have a time complexity of 2n, um, which, you know, uh, same thing in algebra, that's still considered linear. All right, so the last one, we're, but not, this is certainly not uh, an exhaustive list of time complexities. This is just a basic introduction of some common ones. Of course, you can have ones that are logarithmic and uh, cubic, etc., but the last one we're going to discuss is uh, quadratic time. And there's that big O no notation again of n squared. And a dead giveaway that you're dealing with quadratic time might be that you have nested for loops. So in that other one, they're independent of each other. But sometimes you'll have a for loop and a for loop. And that might mean you're dealing with n squared. And so for each item, the algorithm iterates over the entire set again for each of those items. So you see how this could really add up to taking a fair amount of time with a large data set. So it's considered suboptimal. And on this graph, you can kind of see the different time complexities. And as the number of elements on the x-axis grows and grows, we see that constant always stays the same. Linear go goes up in a linear fashion. And then you see the quadratic over there, which basically uh, explodes and then a few other ones that are suboptimal as well. Okay, so the last challenge we're going to have, it's called the balanced sums challenge. So what I want you to do is, and we'll go over one solution here, but find the index in an array where the sum of items to the left of that index equals the sum of items to the right. So for instance, if you have this first array, 2, 4, 6, 6, 4, and 2, um, you should return an index of 2. That is, the first, uh, in, at index 0, 1, and 2, those at, sum up to the same thing as the right of, of that index 2, which is 6, 4, 2. So hopefully this makes sense, how these uh, sums to the left and sums to the right are balanced, and it returns an index of 2. Same thing for the second array. Uh, however, negative 20, negative 30, and negative 100 will sum up to the same as 50 and 100. So we'd say that it's balanced uh, after index 2. All right, hopefully that makes sense. And so there is a way to do this with quadratic algorithms. So you just see, see a big wall of text here. Don't worry about it. You can take time to kind of go through and make sense of it. But this would be a quadratic uh, time complexity. So we'd take an array. We'd throw in an array. We'd loop through it. Uh, so we're going to keep track of our sum to the left of that element and the sum to the right. Uh-oh we have encountered a nested for loop. So in this uh, instance, if the item at index j is to the left of the item at index i, we throw that in the sum to the left. Hope that makes sense. 
And if it is to the right of the uh, item at index i, we'd throw it to the sum of the right. Now after we do, we've done that with um, one nested iteration, we check to see if the sum left equals sum right. If they do, we can return that index. Uh, if not, we'd continue. And then lastly, if there were no uh, balanced sums, we would return an index of negative one. All right, and so the challenge is, can you optimize this to a linear time complexity? So remember, no nested for loops. You can have um, in for loops that are independent of themselves, uh, but it has to be of linear time complexity. So there's a few ways to do this, and this is an interesting challenge, and this is something you're going to encounter a lot, is how can I optimize my algorithms? And you can use an editing tool like uh, Replit, which is you can just throw right in your browser and test your code in real time. All right, I appreciate you staying tuned, and hopefully you learned a little bit about time complexity and how to optimize algorithms. Thank you very much.